today's agenda is on screen at the moment, and we're going to work through, I guess, four core points here. Uh, the goal, of course, being that by the end of today, we're going to have talked about what being data driven actually means, uh, why it's important, you know, why do you care, uh, what data driven businesses do differently, um, and then we're going to take a look in a hands on way um, at some of the things that you can do to use business to add, to use data to add value within your business in order to drive your goal to become a data driven business. And again, we'll be doing that in a little bit of a hands on way, having a look at some concrete use cases and things. And then, as I mentioned, there'll be some questions at the end. So please fire them in uh, wherever, we, wherever you have them. And so, first up, what does data driven mean? And when it comes to making important choices for, for the greater good of an organisation, intuition only goes so far, right? While a, your gut feeling can point executives into the right direction, of course, having some sort of concrete evidence to back up that uh, thought or, or that intuition goes a heck of a long way in convincing other people of the correctness of your, of your gut instinct. And it's critical for leaders to utilise data in order to make the best decisions for the current and for the future state of the business because failing to do that, it, well, it can come with consequences that you know, leave enterprises just trailing in the wake of their competition. Um, this is high stakes game. And a data-driven company, it's an organisation that every person can use data to make better decisions, and I mean every person, and where they can access the data they need when they need it. So that's really the, the core definition there. Being data-driven is not about seeing just a few canned reports at the beginning of every day or every week or, or whatever it might be. It's about giving the business decision makers the power to explore their data independently um, and to embed that into their daily operational life. And, and that means that data-driven businesses, they don't isolate data to specialists, be those specialists within IT or within specific parts of the business or, or even just a handful of people within a specific team. It's universal across the businesses. Data-driven businesses fundamentally recognise the three, the three things that are on the screen at the moment. Data reduces uncertainty and thereby enables better decisions. Fair enough. Anything that does that has got to be good and should be everywhere in your business. And then finally, and this is really important, data fosters a culture of constant questioning and continuous improvement. And that's really quite crucial to, to getting the benefit out of this too. And it's why the culture of being data-driven is so important. So again, given this at heart, being a data-driven business means putting data into the DNA of an organization. Uh, data-driven companies are, are companies that relentlessly measure and monitor the pulse of their business and, and doing it in a widespread and a continuous way. The data, the insights that they generate, um, they're also not solely a management tool. You know, organisations today have put this kind of ability to use data to drive decisions into the hands of frontline staff across the business and the really forward-thinking ones into business partners outside of and adjacent to the, the organisation. And you know, back in the day, businesses relied on Excel spreadsheets right, and other more simple forms of crunching numbers. Today, this isn't the case. The world of analytics has opened the door for companies of all sizes to look at more in-depth data relating to past, and to present figures and how they relate to the future and the forecast. And so staff at every level, and again, at the, for the truly innovative, innovative, that includes people outside of your immediate business into your ecosystem, can mine that information without external support to make better decisions and to create new opportunities through that, that insight. And why does that matter? Well, you know, it's, it's trite to say there's an analytics revolution underway, but it's absolutely true. And in fact, I would make the argument that the revolution is not just underway, it's, it's here, it's been and, and gone, and, and it's, we're looking at it and living it. From top to bottom, the way that the world today works with and thinks about data is not just changing, but has changed. Uh, businesses, economies, society, that the revolution is everywhere, and it doesn't take much to see it. And, I'm going to use an example here of professional sports. You know, this is an industry that is the very definition of competitive, where an inch can mean the difference between a win and a loss. And the effect of that inch can run, in many cases, to hundreds of millions of dollars. I read an article the other day that every home game in an NBA final series is worth something in the order of 20 million US dollars to the team playing in it. Um, that's a lot of money. 
for decades, that kind of ultra competitive industry ran on words and phrases like gut instinct, eye test, talent instinct, all these types of phrases that we, we've heard. And then the new wave hit, the, the analytics revolution hit sports. And over just a few years, the sports industry has gone from an industry that was scornful or, or arguably afraid of analytics to completely dependent on it. There's not a team in any American pro sport, basketball, football, baseball, hockey, that doesn't have full-time multi-person analytics teams. But more than that, ESPN, this is a sports entertainment broadcaster, have entire websites devoted to nothing but detailed statistical analysis of the sports that they're covering. Um, and in on these websites, different types of really quite complex analysis metrics are explained, debated, compared, articles are written on them. I mean, I read an article the other day debating which of these three quite complicated uh, all-in-one um, analytics most effectively measured the on-court impact of a basketball player. And whilst, you know, obviously I live and breathe sports, I live in Melbourne, I'm a sports nut, and obviously I live and breathe analytics. So it's not a great surprise that I'm into this. But remember, this is a public for-profit website focusing at sports junkies. If these guys think that this is so prevalent in society now that they need a website and that that website has an audience for this kinds of things, they're not doing it for one or two sports data freaks. They're doing it for a wide market. You know, again, at the, at the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference recently, ESPN and Ticketmaster both sponsored awards. If, it, if analytics is part of mainstream sports entertainment, then that's about as mainstream as it's going to get. And you know, saying my staff don't understand data well enough for us to be data driven, it just doesn't cut it these days. If they don't, that's on you. You need to help change it or your business is going backwards. But also the staff who do and the best and most insightful and energy people who do, they're not going to stay with you or they're not coming to you. They're going to your competition because they're not getting what they need to excel in their roles. Um, and there's a key here as well before I move on. You know, most of us have at least heard of, of Billy Bean and Moneyball. You know, Brad Pitt played him in, in an Academy Award movie, so I guess it's about as mainstream as that gets. But an interesting thing about that is that what they what they identified and acted on is now so commonplace in baseball that in fact the opposite of a lot of what he originally found is now true. The bargains that he found are now premium items and the race is on to identify the next competitive advantage. What was originally undervalued in sports is now being overvalued. And that's the crux of it. It's not enough to simply watch what everyone else does and catch that wave. That is the way to mediocrity at best. So again, what am I saying? Well, you can see some, uh, some basic statistics here on the screen. And fundamentally, I'm saying that it's past time that growth focused businesses look at their data as an aid to success. Um, at the same time, I'm also saying that for a lot of organizations, you know, a lot of organizations struggle mightily just to get a handle on the data that they already have. Um, you know, once they've located and collected and, and classified and organized that data, they've still got to manage the processes needed to ensure that it's, it's timely and it's accurate and it's complete and it's reliable and all that type of thing now. So there's a lot here. And even once you've wrangled that data under control, um, integrating it into the decision-making process, it can be a challenging step. Um, especially amongst managers that are accustomed to acting on gut instinct or intuition and, or experience or whatever. So for all that I said on the last slide, um, it's true that for many businesses, whilst people are increasingly used to assimilating data, they're still not always used to using it in their business lives. Um, organizations and their leaders sometimes need a lot of fortitude and persistence and, and not to mention a careful balance really between patience and impatience to build successful and analytics initiatives. It, it's a big ask uh, and it helps explain why so many of these kinds of initiatives fall short of expectations. But it's worth it, it really is. It's simply and undeniably worth it. So what does a data-driven decisions make? Did this data-driven business look like? And how do I become more data-driven? I guess uh, the one inarguable identifier of a data-driven business is data democracy within the business. Um, everyone within the business can benefit from data. Everyone can contribute to the data. Uh, this is really key to identifying if you are genuinely a data-driven business and if this is your culture. A very common reason for BI projects not taking root within organisations 
is that the users don't understand or, or don't trust their data models and so they don't use them. Numbers get calculated away from the users in isolation and then pushed down to them without the opportunity for the users to review or understand or comment or, or identify where they've come from. Um, the dramatic increase in data literacy that we already discussed here, then combine that with the ability of modern BI tool sets means that you can deliver pools of data, data out to your users in a way that still allows them to first of all validate, but then investigate and modify that data to address their individual questions and requirements and to still all do that in a governed way. And the outcome of this is that this initial data mistrust, even if you get it and, and done properly, you don't get it because you're involving your users from the day one to build this. But even if you do get this kind of data mistrust, it actually becomes an opportunity with, for your BI project to grow and thrive rather than for it to shrink and, and to wither. Because when your users are able to interrogate and validate the data that they're presented with, they begin to trust and understand it. And then once they can iterate upon that and provide feedback upon that and massage it and make it work for them, for their role in their ways and the ways that are meaningful for them, then immediately you've gone from something that uh, doesn't necessarily pass the sniff test to I get it, to now it works for me and it's mine and I own it and I run with it. And you're building a consensus across the business on the truth of the data and your staff owning their own data and they're using their own data. Um, and you're under the way, you know, engaging end users and, and democratizing data, it's the key here. And it, it helps in another way too. And, and that's in that it makes it transparent to everyone what data is being collected. Because keeping these things secret, it, it makes it feel to, like people are being evaluated against the mysterious criteria. If you let your employees know what it takes to win, and help them define what it takes to win, then once again, you get that, uh, that engagement and that enjoyment of, of mutual success. And, and lastly on this too, you know, it's important to understand when you're trying to democratise, or at least to acknowledge, when you're trying to democratise your data, that barriers to information, you know, they're not always skills-based or technological, let's be honest here. A lot of the times, historically at least, departments and, and business units or operating units or whatever you call them, They've often collected and analysed their own data and then presented that out to the rest of the business only when mandated or when they have to. Um, and this can be a challenge to becoming a data-driven culture as well. This concept of, of data isolation and silos, you know, this is the opposite of data democracy. Um, and it leads us neatly to the next sign of data-driven business by an amazing coincidence. So data-driven companies, make a point of encouraging information sharing and collaboration. Um, and they're using it to identify and to solve cross-functional problems. And this is another key here, cross-functional that weren't previously apparent and, and to gain a new type of competitive advantage from that. But it has to start from the top. So it's one thing to demand of your people, use data. But it's quite another to demonstrate data-driven decision-making, to demonstrate critical thinking, to demonstrate this kind of curiosity. And not surprisingly, when your business leaders lead by example, they're much more inclined to make the technology and the human capital investments necessary to enable a data-driven organisation. And this is to some extent a motherhood statement, but it's absolutely crucial and important as well. This leadership, you know, it's got to include the bravery as well to, to share success, yes, but to share struggle. Um, and this can get challenging. To create a data-driven business, it's, it's critical that all of the employees have access to all of the figures representing their teams, not just their individual, but their team's activities. This means then that all of the team members have got a really precise understanding of the strengths and weaknesses inherent in their team. Um, and then at, at your all hands meeting or your monthly meeting or whatever it might be, you take these team things, you alloy them together and you broadcast out the broader numbers uh, from your current and your previous periods as well. And now instantly the business can see how do I slot into my team, my team into the business and how are the KPIs doing? And it brings the focus instantly back onto the things that move the needle for the numbers that matter to your business. Uh, it reinforces that data is key to what is going on in your business. It, it highlights that data is both essential to success and foundational to the definition of success. Um, this is, you know, this is, really important and it's, it's crucial here to get the messaging and the culture right on this too because 
data visibility can't be a blame game. You know, there, there are two big fears that people have when they're starting to shift into a data-driven culture like this. Uh, the first is that they're going to be scrutinized and, and potentially punished because everything is now being measured much more publicly. And the second is the concern that a more numbers focused business can remove the opportunity for innovation and creativity. And this can be challenging in, in different types of businesses, depending on what your overall culture and what your industry is. But fundamentally, it comes back to leadership. Leadership needs to help overcome these concerns. It needs to show how becoming data driven can really help people in their jobs, that it's not about punishing them. Um, initially, people who haven't had clear metrics around their performance, quite often they resist this kind of change for obvious reasons. But in the long run, there are studies after studies that show that people perform better, have higher satisfaction and markedly lower stress levels when it is clear to them what it takes to succeed. And again, this comes from the top down. This is what it means to permeate a data-driven culture through your business. So to create a meaningful culture change, you know, leadership's got to be able to do this and to show how the change is going to help the business and how it's going to impact the individual. Because ultimately, what does this mean for me is what everyone asks. And it's about making sure too that when something does fail, data is not about blame. It's about identifying the trigger point for the failure, spinning out from that to identify any corollary actions that can then go to refine that and to avoid that failure in past, and potentially to resetting expectations to a more manageable level that still improves, uh, still is bringing us back up to our target, but revising those targets to something more, more realistic as well. Um, and that's crucial to not just employee health, but the business health. You know, if you're talking simple things, if your revenue targets aren't being met, there's no value putting your head in the sand and continuing to say, this is our target and we're just going to budget for it. You've got to know early, proactively adjust, make things realistic, take the actions to push back up towards the target, but also make some sensible planning for what a revised target might look like. Um, and a bit like the, the last thing we said with democratizing data, once you do this kind of leadership and action, um, it's going to generate at least one thing for certain, and that is analysis of the data and discussion of the data. And again, that's two of the most visible signs that your business is becoming data driven. If nobody's looking at or nobody's talking about your data, then it becomes blindingly obvious, isn't it, that, that it isn't important to you or your company, that you are not data driven. Um, another effect of a leadership driven approach to data driven business is that it does encourage your business processes to mold around this data focus. When data is at the front of conversations, then the activities change to deliver actions that are based upon that data. Um, Douglas Hubbard, who has written a ton of books on, on these sort of topics, he's got a great saying. Uh, two good indicators of revealed preference are the things that people value a lot, time and money. If you look at how people spend their time and how they spend their money, you can infer quite a lot about their real preferences. Now, again, this is at the risk of becoming a, a bit of a motherhood statement. But business leaders who spend time on data analysis and then money on actions derived from that analysis, they inevitably drive a culture in which data is important to the business. So the next thing to look at in what defines a data-driven business is the concept of, of the, your, what is your data? Too much, too little, how much do I have, where's it come from? Data-driven businesses need to have command of all of their data. And in fact, that, that itself is, is not actually true. It's never going to be perfectly true. Data-driven organizations are constantly looking for new data and new data sources. So they will never have a perfect command of their data because if you've done that, you've stopped growing your data pool and that's a big mistake. You're, you're no longer a data-driven business. But that all being said, data-driven businesses do have excellent control over their data. And this means their entire data landscape. And there are two completely and utterly conflicting arguments that we quite often hear and, and have to overcome that can make this piece too challenging, or well, not too challenging, but can make it challenging. And the first is that a business already has access to all of its data. Um, you know, modern ERP, CRM, whatever, similar tools like that, they can give a business the illusion that everything's already at their fingertips. And look, let's be honest, this is a mindset that's often supported by the need to justify the sometimes considerable investment in these kinds of tools. Now, the reality is that good implementations of these kinds of tools 
they provide an absolutely fantastic, uh, the ideal foundation, the ideal platform for the collection of the data. But equally, the reality is there is such a proliferation of information in the world today. And for reasons of you know budget and, and business quirks or uniqueness or the complexity of your business, it's frankly inevitable that there are going to be additional systems, additional data sources that are growing alongside these central systems to, to supplement or to expand what's in them. So the idea that I already have access to everything, it's, it's appealing and it would be lovely, but it's a fundamental fallacy. And at best, it's a reflection of a narrow mindset. The other common uh, and, and completely contradictory mistake is to assume that your business is struggling to become data driven because you don't have enough data. Um, you know, the reality is that most of us have got more than enough to at least begin making insightful decisions, but that that data is poorly managed and exploited. Um, often companies have got all the data they need to tackle their business problems, but the managers don't know how they can use it to make decisions. Uh, it feeds into something we've talked about in the past and, and we'll be talking about in, in the coming session about self-service. Um, and the ability to, to short circuit cues and to ask and answer your own questions. But equally, it can be things like, you know, operations executives might not grasp the, the value of looking at the factory, daily and hourly factory data or the customer service data that's already possessed and the value of blending that in to inform their own analyses. Um, you know, companies can encourage a much more comprehensive look at their data by telling, being really specific about the problems and opportunities that they're trying to address. And in either case, success means quickly identifying, connecting to the most important sources of data, um, and then mounting an ongoing and an iterative operation to add, to synchronize, to merge overlapping data and to work around missing information. Um, it's a refrain that I've used once before, but possibly more than once before, but just start. So to become a data-driven business, make sure you can understand and connect to your data. And given the numerous sources and systems that businesses have today, and then that's the reality, again, whether you think you have too much or you think you have too little, the reality is you've got plenty and in plenty of places, this can still be a challenge. The answer is find a way to bring it together. Don't switch back and forth between the platforms. You know, again, only when data analysis is a tool instead of a challenge is a data-driven culture going to thrive. And one of the last hallmarks of what a data-driven business looks like before we move to the next part of this is that data-driven businesses really understand that when it comes to a data landscape, as I've said before, something's better than nothing and there's always something else that you can go to to find useful data. But what does that look like when you're on the path to becoming data-driven? Um, again, perfection is an unattainable goal. Just accept it. The answer to unattainable perfection is iteration. Uh, as any of you have attended you know, some of the earlier webinars of this series, my, my most common refrain, and I, I said it just a second ago, is just start. If you let yourself become locked into place by fear of imperfection, you're never going to move. And for a business on a journey to becoming data-driven, this is the opportunity. By throwing your measurements out into the wild, then you will inevitably be challenged on those measurements. It's not something to fear, it's something to embrace as I've talked about here. Once you start to engage with the business in a brave way and say, this is what I'm looking at, this is the information I have. Is it true, is it valid? And you've got the tool sets in the background to respond to the communication and to allow people to understand that communication, to understand the data you're giving them. The discussion about the data, the refinement of the data, then just becomes a, a a natural thing and it percolates through the business and this is foundational to a data-driven mindset. Um, the second thing that's important about measurements is creativity and an open mindset. Um, you know, there's an often quoted example, uh, Amazon. Uh, they wanted to know how many of their customers were purchasing gifts um, online as opposed to for personal use. Um, and the idea was they could put a tick box and, and just say, you know, is this why you're purchasing it? But the fear was that customers would just ignore it or, or get irritated if they were mandated to answer it. So Amazon took a different approach and they identified that this data had a value. So they started providing free gift wrapping to their customers upon request. Is this a gift? Would you like a free gift wrap? 
the marginal cost of the wrapping in their mind was less than the value that they put on the data and customers were incented to provide the information in a way that not just gave them that, gave them the information they wanted, but it actually made the customer more positively disposed to Amazon due to the free service anyway. Uh, I was working with a customer just yesterday who was looking for some address information for people that, um, that were working with things for, for them. And they were concerned that by asking for a residential address, they were dealing with organisations as well, um, but for asking for a residential address, they were concerned that people were going to um, start to feel that they were becoming overly invasive. Again, the idea that was thrown around and mooted was, well, maybe we can offer to send them out some sort of a certificate or something like that um, to represent these people doing courses and things um, or event packs or whatever it might be. There are ways to, to collect data that you don't have and sources of data that you can't necessarily think of until you're prepared to get a little bit creative and innovative. So when you're looking at the data picture, I guess the takeaway from all this is, is threefold. One, the data you have is almost certainly more complete than you think. Two, it's never going to be fully complete and, and nor should it be. And three, get creative about where the gaps are, where you can find it and who can provide it. And the who can provide it here. You know, businesses do need to get creative about the potential for, for external and new sources of data. Look to your business partners, you know, look to social media, there's terabytes of non-traditional unstructured data, conversations, photos, videos, all kinds of stuff out there. Um, look to sensors and monitored processes and, and things like that. You know, look to external sources, local demographics um, in Australia, the ABS, look to weather forecasts. Um, all of these different things are at sources of data that are relatively easy to bring in. You know, one of the simple ways to, to prompt a broader thinking about your potential data is if we start from an assumption that we had everything that we need, what decisions could we make? And then work back from there to identify where the gaps are and then work back from there to identify what can I deliver today and how can I close those gaps? And again, at the heart is a modern iterative BI tool that means you can quickly blend data sets to encourage this kind of innovation. So that's a whole lot to digest and a lot of words. And in just a minute, I'm gonna jump into a live system for one of the BI tools that we use here at Microchannel. And we're gonna just take a, a quick dive through uh, a handful of different ways that a, a truly data-driven business is pushing these kinds of things throughout all different parts of their business. Um, how there are opportunities for your data to stimulate and support a, a real inquiring, continually improving mindset in every single aspect of your business. Um, so let's do just that. Okay, and what we might do is take a look at, well, let's start with in a marketing leads and, and campaign type of environment. Um, this is relatively straightforward concept to a lot of people, the idea of how um, analytics can, can assist their marketing team. But let's, take a bit of a concrete look at some examples of what that might look like, shall we? And so to start with, you can see here, we've got a, a relatively basic uh, marketing leads and campaign performance dashboard. This is in one of the tools. We've got lots of tools that we work with. The tool is kind of not what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, if we have an overall look at this, there's lots of different sheets here, uh, lots of different things to see. Um, but we can see that overall our new leads, our pipeline generated and our web traffic, as we can see on these three metrics, are trending down. But we can also see that our conversion rate is improving slightly. Fantastic. Quick look off to the side, FeedBurner and Google are the biggest referral sources. That's great. Um, our social stuff, Twitter and LinkedIn, are not bringing a lot of leads. Interesting to note that there is, however, a big difference between the number of leads we're bringing in and the conversion rates on those leads. Um, we can see uh, quite easily if we shift across um, that the majority of our leads are coming from generic cross-functional campaigns. But again, the conversion rate on those types of campaigns is much lower than the conversion rate on our more targeted and focused campaigns. Um, yeah. 
I'm just thinking about how much detail to go into here. Um, you know, again, we can zoom in and we can say, well, let's now take a look at our targeted campaigns that we're getting a nice high conversion rate on. Oops. There we go. And now we can see, well, where are they coming from? Oops. And what is most successful for us looks to be, oh, webinars are right down there, right down there low on our rate. Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing here. Email campaigns, our many-to-many -many type of things are not as successful as our in-person type environments. And this is just uh, completely generic data. This is not real data by any means. Um, the point here, I guess, is that this is a relatively straightforward and obvious use of analytics. A lot of people get the idea that marketing leads and campaign performance can be really easily identified and analysed. But there is still value in, in this and opportunities to drill in and ask questions and confirm gut instincts with hard facts and say, you know what, these are the numbers, this is the reality we're facing and this is how we're going to move our marketing forward. Let's take a look here though at some workforce performance and talent management uh, metrics. And this is something that's not necessarily such an obvious target for a lot of businesses when they think of uh, analytics. Um, let's take a bit of a look at this one. And so in this case, we're taking a look at um, total number of employees, average salary, the attrition rates, that type of stuff. And we can very easily see that uh, our retail departments have easily, and this is not necessarily surprising, um, our highest number of employees, but they also have our highest number of female employees. Uh, when we start to move down the sequence, and particularly as we get up the top, management has our lowest number of employees, as we might expect, but it also has easily our lowest gender proportion. Um, some people might tell me that this is a fairly obvious statement. Um, equally, we can come in here and we can have a look at our pay analysis by employee, coloured by gender. There's a trend there as well. Um, a nice, simple, visual way of looking at this, but something that's perhaps um, a little bit less immediately obvious when you look at raw numbers, but when you look at it here, it becomes really obvious. We look at the age distribution of our business. The gender sequence is fairly simple, but we're a workforce here that's skewing quite, uh, quite heavily towards the older brackets. Um, equally, as we start to move up that, we can see, not surprisingly, that our tenure is getting, as we get to older people, the tenure is getting longer as well. This is not necessarily all that surprising. Um, and that retail and production are where our longest tenured, oldest employees are skewing. So perhaps now it's time that our HR department started to do some recruitment campaigns, some succession planning in these spaces. Um, you can also start to come and look for some of the stuff that's maybe not so immediately obvious. We come across and we'll have a look at our compensation. You know, we can see all kinds of interesting things here. Um, but if we have a look by uh, our um, total versus average comp uh, by region, have a look around here. We can see we've got a big couple of big outliers, but one in particular is Galway. Let's come in and have a look at our Galway salary information. And it's heavily skewed by only a couple of employees, um, particularly our district manager. And our district manager out at Galway, which is a small branch, is being compensated quite heavily, particularly by comparison to their alternatives. And it's an age demographic that is skewing in a particular way as well. Maybe that's suggesting some, some opportunities and some actions that we might, we might want to take. So that's from a fairly natural and obvious use of analytics in uh, our marketing leads and campaign performance through to something that's not necessarily so immediately obvious to people, our workforce performance. Um, I'm going to go fairly quickly here through some of the things that we might measure as a manufacturing business. And I'm going to do this quickly because this is something that is not universal to all of the businesses. If you don't do manufacturing at all, then clearly this is not going to be anything that is relevant to you. But again, you can see uh, scrap percentages, runtime fulfillment, um, you know, actual versus our standard costs and, and dollars per roll as we make stuff. Where is it skewing in what ways? What's not profitable? What isn't? 
you can come in and do quite a lot of analysis as a manufacturer. Where is our scrap, scrap going and what percentage of our things are, uh, uh, of our revenue is, is getting converted into scrap? Where are our shipments going? There's all kinds of interesting things when you get into analysis. And this is without then looking at the concepts of machine analysis and runtime analysis and costs of breakdowns and the effects um, on your production schedules and those types of things. Um, there's a world of information in manufacturing analysis and it's surprisingly easy to get in there. And it's the type of information that when presented visually is so much easier to make sense of than when it's presented in a series of columns and rows and numbers and, and basic stuff. Um, so from something a little bit niche, again, I'm just gonna jump very quickly into something that is a bit more universal, uh, expense management. And you know, again, as I said, this is something that's pretty universal expense management. Um, we'll take a quick look at an, an example of what we might do in the space of expense management. And we can see here very quickly, what's our expenses look like? What's our trend? You know, we can see instantly, you know what? Airfare is what is killing us in expenses comfortably, followed by internal cross charges, but it's, it's comfortably airfares is our biggest expense. Um, and when we choose that, we can see, you know what? Our biggest consumer of travel, not necessarily surprising, is sales and service, um, which makes, makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, you know, when we have a look over here, we can see which of our um, people are consuming our expenses. And interestingly, Zahir is our biggest spender, but is only consuming a relatively low part of their budget, so that's okay. Lisa is not spending huge amounts relatively, but she is eating up her budget pretty quickly, something to be aware of. Um, and that might prompt a, a nice simple action, particularly to, to Leela, I'm sorry, not Lisa, to Leela, to let her know, you know, you may not be costing us big dollars, but you don't have big dollars to play with, Leela. Uh, is that something that we need to talk about and have a look at? Um, there's all kinds of opportunities there. I'm just looking at our time and I don't want to go too much further into this. One last thing to take a bit of a brief look at. And that is the idea of then it becomes cross-functional. So everything we've looked at there is individual businesses, units, looking at their data, certainly using that data to branch out and talk to other business units and to provide value across the business. But here we're having a look at some of the types of things that we might do cross-operationally, some finance sales and operations planning dashboards. And again, what's our revenue looking like? What's our variance to forecast? How's that looking? What's our margin looking like? Um, all these types of things, you know, where are our variances to forecast coming from, in which product categories, where's our profitability, um, revenue by which channel, revenue by which region, revenue by which customer segment, all that type of stuff. Um, and this is fantastic stuff for stimulating some discussions across business units, uh, identifying opportunities, both where things are going well and where they're going not so well, and driving outcomes. Um, Conscious of time, I'm going to jump back in and we might start to uh, wrap things up here. Um, as you can see, there's a world of opportunities here. You know, people, again, everyone gets kind of that analytics can be really useful in sales, performance management and pipeline management and these types of things. There is amazing value that you can get playing with your analytics around customer service and call center environments as well. Uh, you know, from the simple and the obvious, um, where are my tickets, you know, how many are being processed, that type of stuff, to the next um, type of analysis that, well, let's have a look at, you know, we can see from this that not too surprisingly, our chat is trending gent gently upwards in terms of how many ticket types are coming in via chat channels, and our email is trending gently downwards. So it seems like chat is replacing email, which is probably a fairly universal trend for chat-enabled businesses, and the phone's holding relatively steady. But having looked at this data before, I know this to be true. If I have a look at what's happening through my traditional sources, I can see that my satisfaction scores and things are reasonable, I'm taking 2.71 days to resolve it. When I flip that around the other way and I have a look around at my chat channel, even though it's trending upwards, it's taking us longer to resolve it. Um, we've got a not particularly impressive first touch resolution, first touch resolution rate. So perhaps this is something that we need to investigate a little bit more. It's trending upwards. Our customers seem like they want it. Maybe we need to start to have a look at making sure that our people are trained effectively 
on processing chat help calls quickly, effectively, and successfully. All kinds of stuff there.